Give him a James Bond wink. Oh, perfect. Hello, Matty. Coming up next on Rugby Wrap-Up, George Hook, Mike Friday, Martin Pengelly, and Matt McCarthy talk Rugby World Cup 2019. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to Rugby Wrap-Up. Matt McCarthy with Martin Pingeli in Midtown Manhattan talking rugby uh, World Cup stuff. Uh, Martin, welcome to the studio once again. Pleasure to be here as uh, Steve Lewis is standing. Yes, well, you know, I, I don't know. He, he, Wally Pip replaced Luke, uh, Luke Gehrig replaced Wally Pip, I should say. So Steve might want to be aware. In the meantime, we've got his proxy again next to us. But Steve is off coaching the Jamaican Sevens team, of all people, a Scotsman who le- flew from New York, I think, uh, Denmark Air or something, you know? <laughs> yes, that sounds like the, the lizard. Yeah, so... Champagne lizard. Martin, uh, we, we can't dilly-dally because we've got two big shots calling in again from overseas, one in England and the other in England. Uh, we've got George Hook changing it up again from Portugal and Dublin. He's now in London. George, welcome. Uh, thank you for having me, Matt, and hello, Martin. Hello. George, you are a technological wizard, and we have one of your uh, protégés, Mike Friday, learning how to use Skype all over the planet. He's in Chester, England. Mike, Mike Friday, welcome. How are you? Yeah, good, to, good to be on again. How are you, Martin? Okay? Yep, I'm good. How are you? Uh, Mike, is that, are those tiles behind you with the Chester uh, mark, or is that just a... Roman. Roman tiles. <laughs> Roman tiles, of course, of course, because Chester, as you know, was formed in 6 AD by the Romans. That's probably true. Probably true. I got that from the Guardian. Uh, so, guys, let's get right into it, into the Rugby World Cup that's going on in Japan right now. Qui parle français? Qui parle français? Anyone? Comment dit-on? No. Inadvertent <laughs> elbow en français. <laughs> well, I mean, it was... It was- it was a stupidity by the uh, French second row, a hot-headed, um, and it was a game-changer. I thought France were outstanding in the first half, in control of the game, direct, powerful. We're giving Wales a lot of problems, and we we thought we were in for that special French performance, but I um, thought Wales hung in there. They rode the yellow card well, and the, ch- the turning point was that red card. That gave Wales... Some belief, but more importantly, it took the, the wind out of the French sails, I think, and they lost some of their power and their directness. And, you know, I think Wales, for grit and determination, probably won the game on, on just that. I think the best team lost, as Gatlin has said, but uh, you ride your luck, and they're in the semi finals. France came over after World War II to Dublin, and the two seconders were enormous. They were six foot two apiece. Um, obviously, French uh, cuisine didn't suffer during World War II, but they have always been magnificent because essentially they're not great at playing to a system. And what happened to me, in my view, is I think the strike was real. Uh, I think the players said, look, we don't want to play like Brunel wants us to play. We want to play the way we want to play. And then we saw some wonderful French rugby. We saw the French rugby of Serge Blanco uh, and all the great French players that I've watched over 50 odd years. I I just thought they were magnificent. Uh, I, I, I agree with Brunel. I, I think there's a doubt about the Welsh uh, try. Uh, and again, we have a situation of referees going to the TMO when they don't need to go to the TMO and not going to the TMO when they should go to the TMO. So, uh, And the good news is Jacko Piper will not be doing the semi-final or indeed the final, which is the best news I've heard this week. Martin, you're the Welsh rugby expert here. Uh, was it a tie? Was it a try? And are Wales too thin? Are they too banged up going forward? It wasn't a try, I don't think. Um, and I'm saying this from the squarely biased uh, standpoint of being English. Uh, I, That's I, allowed I'm, here. That's allowed. <laughs> I'm, I'm biased. I mean, I, I've, I, I'm going to say the actual, the classic formula. I've got a lot of Welsh friends, but um, the Welsh rugby team gets on my wick so <laughs> fans because they don't like the English team very much. And so I'm probably biased when I'm saying it wasn't a try, but it seemed to just clearly go forward. And you're going to the, you're going to the video referee who's saying it didn't. Uh, I don't, 
George was alluding to it there. You don't go to the video when you need to, and when you do, the video gets it wrong. That's why I am a Luddite on that kind of thing and would rather there was just no video. Yeah, well, it, it depends. And when they utilize it correctly, it's helpful, and you want to get it right, but they, they seem to be botching it at every turn. I mean, it's, it's, well, Not it's, every turn, but a lot. Well, I, mean, whether, I don't even know whether botch is the right thing. I mean, there, there are some video circumstances where it's just impossible to tell what, yeah. which way. And these days, the uh, decisions tend to go in favor of tries most of the time, which um, bugs me. I don't have sports which sort of try and uh, lean things towards the scoring of points, scoring of tries. I'm not sure that's kind of right. I'm still also bitter 12 years on about the 2007 final and Mark Cueto's toe. I still think that was a try. Other people don't. I know that's half the point, so fair enough. And if I argue for human fallibility on the part of referees without video, maybe I should argue for human fallibility on the part of referees who are sitting in front of video. I don't know. The whole thing's a mess. There's the conundrum, isn't it? Yeah, there's a conundrum. My own argument, I can go straight back at me. I'm just, you know, I can't, bear, <laughs> I can't bear the thought of Wales beating England in a World Cup final. I'd have to probably kill myself. Yeah, I'm but at least you live over here. You don't live in England. I still know lots of Welsh people. My poor brother teaches in Wales and lives just in England. I mean, very close to where Mike is. In well, you can't say poor brother because he teaches in Wales. What the? Come on. Well, he gets so much stick. Let's, we got to give some respect. Guys, the guy that edits all this is Welsh. Let's keep that in mind, okay? Johnny, Johnny Lewis is over there. He's crazy. He, so he works it. for us. I think the nuance of the law is... Um, because the way Williams was facing, which was towards his own try line, that's the nuance, which means that even if the ball goes forward, it doesn't go forward off of him. So I think it's just understanding the nuances of the law when it, when it, when it is a written situation. It's not a conventional, what we would call tackle or, or forward passing motion. So I think that's where they went on the, on the TMO. And I don't pretend to understand it fully. I've just kind of read and listened to, to what was said in the explanation. But you know, the reality is, you know, we did see over the weekend, Wayne Barnes was very clear about not going to the TMO on, on certain things and keep keep the game fluid. So I, I, I do believe that refereeing is an art, not a science. We're not alone, are we? I mean, as you said, baseball, I mean, football are having a, a right old time of it with VAR, or should I say soccer, yeah. are having a right mm -hmm. old time of it with VAR at the moment. George, I got to give you an opportunity to, to weigh on in this, on the question of whether or not we should have the lines... Um, computerized or, or electronic. What do you think of that? The laws of the game of rugby are fair, fairly clear cut. What we are now seeing, in fact, is only two of those laws are actually being refereed. Uh, crooked in the scrum isn't being refereed. No hooker, every single hooker is standing in the field of play before he throws the ball in. And offside is simply a joke. So the only two laws that they're implementing is at the tackle, stroke, or rock, uh, and foul play. And they go to the TMO for foul play. Every, otherwise, everything else is fair game. Crooked in the line out, one we, one, depending on the referee, uh, it's straight or it isn't. So uh, they might as well forget the laws entirely and just go back to rugby school and the wall game or whatever the hell they played. I think that might have been eaten. But anyway. Um, the oddball <laughs> games they play, they might as well go back. If they're not going to have any laws, like what is the point? Why not just draw a line through the law that says you must put the ball in straight at the scrum? And it, luckily, we, we are now at a semi-final stage. I think we're going to get uh, two quite good, reasonable games by sides who actually want, by and large, want to play rugby. They're not like Ireland, who simply play off a playbook uh, in which it's like a John Grisham novel, everybody dies at the end. <laughs> All right, okay. I, I'm going to simplify, oversimplify this. I thought it was a try. I th I was okay with it. I didn't think it was tipped forward, and I'm I'm backing Wales. And speaking in c continuing our thread of speaking in foreign tongues, because that's now a thread here. I got a quote, and you're a man of the arts like the rest of us. We like the arts and rugby. I got an, a quote from Robert Downey Jr., a.k.a. Iron Man, uh, who said on Instagram, Wales through to the Rugby World Cup semis. Come on, die on, boys. Martin, you want to you take this one? Yeah, I'll take this one. I've already rehearsed it on Twitter. Um, Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola were right about Marvel films. They're not cinema. And they're even more right now because he's supporting Wales. Oh. So, you know, I'm, oh. I'm done. It's okay to be scared. 
All right. I'm done fair, with him. All right. Okay. Fair mm-hmm. enough. Let's move on. South Africa versus Japan. It was a Major League Baseball score at halftime, George. And since you're the baseball expert, let's go to you first on this one. 5-3 at half or 3-5 at half. Well, I think, I'm not sure whether we, I think we were unanimous last week that South Africa will win because uh, there was a great phrase in professional boxing, which was that a good big one will always be a good little one. And that applies also <laughs> to rugby. So ultimately, the, the wonderful Japanese playing absolutely extraordinary rugby came up against a much bigger team that eventually squeezed the life out of them. And by half time, they needed to be in front. They weren't because the South African defense was so good. And then I think it looked, you know, it was all over then. Uh, and South Africa, and I, I, before this tournament started, I thought they would win it. Uh, based on what I've seen, they are going to be, I mean, they're going to be Wales uh, pretty comfortably, I would have thought. Um, but they're going to be very difficult to beat, New Zealand or not. Mike, the romantic in you last week wanted to pick Japan. Did that romantic see a combined point total of eight points at the half? I mean, I'm with George. I think Japan were were phenomenal in terms of staying with the South African power. Um, but I think he just hit the nail on the head. A good big and always beats a good little. And um, I think the power game of the South Africans just wore the Japanese down. Uh, and then they found some little nooks and crannies and some holes and, and, and they flooded through it. And I think, you know, Japan have been absolutely amazing in this tournament. They probably, they didn't outperform. I think, you know, it, it, when you look at it, they, they, they got where they deserved and they've moved forward as a nation. They've moved forward as a rugby nation in terms of the way they play the game, the credibility, also the, the tournament they've put on and, and they've certainly earned their right to, to sit at the top table. But this South African team is, is powerful. It is formidable. Um, and it's going to take a, uh, a good, powerful team to, to stay with them and, and, and match them. And, you know, I, I think Wales can do that. I think if uh, if Foxy Davis is back in the centre, I think that will that will secure up the D and that will probably bring a lot more confidence and, and line speed to the Welsh defence. Um, and interesting enough, Garcia is, is, is refereeing this one and I don't think South Africa have won... Well, they've won one game in 10 games that Garcia's ref. So and they're not sending him a Christmas card anytime game. soon, are they? Is Andre Pollard the weakest of the fly halves left in the tournament? And arguably, is he like this? He could be sixth if you count Ford and Bowden Barrett as fly halves. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not. I've, I've, I've disqualified everything I'm about to say before by being so rude about Wales. So I apologize. Are you going to be rude about South Africa? Well, no, because I think I think Andre Pollard's a pretty good player. I mean, um, that I, wasn't I, the question. I know it wasn't. I was, that's where I was getting to. I don't think he's the weakest fly half left in. I think that would be one of the Wales two, Bigger or Patchell. Um, Dan Bigger actually gets on my wick by being further endearing himself <laughs> to the nation of Wales. Well, they never endeared themselves <laughs> to me, even though you know, hello, Julian Cooper in London, good friend, etc. Um, I, uh, I, I no, I, I, th- I think Wales. Mike sort of alluded it to alluded to it to there how badly they played against France and how um, they have a lack of ambition, perhaps coached into them. They're very defensive side. Their defense and their physical game is great, but they're going to have to. I think Mike said they'll have to be more accurate against South Africa. They'll have to be a lot better in attack, and I think so a lot of that comes off ten. I mean, I think I've, I've very few centers I admire more than Jonathan Davis. I think Alan Wynne Jones is a genius. I don't hate Wales. I really don't. I think so, lots of their players are great. I'm just being an Englishman. But I think they, they're going to come up against the South Africa team, which is, is like them, but better. Them, but more yeah. lethal. And yeah. I think South Africa will win. Before we break for commercial, let's get on to the, the one that George called all along. Ireland, New Zealand. George, I bow to you, my friend, despite the, the, the curses that you've thrown by your countrymen this entire two-month period leading up to and including Ireland's World Cup appearance. On the 20th of May 2017, I wrote an article in which I said Joe Schmidt's history would be that he would be seen as a very bad coach and a very bad selector. Uh, That has come to pass. But the problem is that he now has coached Ireland to two quarterfinals and conceded the guts of 90 points in those two quarterfinals. No other coach in Irish history has that kind of record uh, 
in a World Cup. But the problem for us is that beating New Zealand, although it's it's great stuff and it's very hard to do, um, but beating them is in a friendly and beating them in the quarterfinal of the Rugby World Cup are two totally different kind of matches. And then when you try and beat them and you pick uh, the oldest team that you can find uh, eligible to wear a green jersey and you leave all your talent on the bench when your halfbacks have spent a year and a half without a worthwhile game between them, then you're inviting what we got. He nailed his colours to a Henshaw um, Bundyaki centre partnership. Uh, that fell apart at the seams. He let his talent of like he picked Carney, uh, who uh, in a, in a hundred and odd caps has never broken the game line. So he picked a team that couldn't beat New Zealand. Now well, I didn't think they'd lose. I must say, as as an Irishman, I don't get any pleasure. Uh, uh, as a critic of Joe Schmidt, I get enormous pleasure. As an Irishman, I don't get any pleasure in seeing us hockeyed uh, by New Zealand. When you have a win in Chicago against the All Blacks, and then you beat them again in Dublin, and your combination at scrum half and fly half got you there prior to the World Cup, you're probably going to go to that. T- you're going to go to that well again. I think Georgie's got some points in the fact that Ireland didn't play well. I, I think they didn't have a plan B. I think they were they were continually trying these runarounds from nine or ten and just getting smashed back off the game line. Um, and it was just easy pickings for for the physical All Black front five and back row. I mean, I thought Kieran Reid was just immense defensively, but also he's subtly the way he pulled them apart with his little soft hands in attack. Yeah. But I think, look, I think Ireland probably were a, a year past where they were at their peak. Um, when they won the Grand Slam, you know, probably George is alluding to the fact that maybe they hadn't prepared the strength in depth or given them enough game time over the last 18 months to allow that continuity in the event that Henshaw is injured, that Sexton is slightly off or carrying knocks, that Connell Murray isn't quite playing how he wants to or Henshaw is injured. And I think, you know, that's where you look at the teams in the semi final and they do have that strength in depth. I think. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with George Hook, Mike Friday, and Martin Pingelli right after this. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig & Whistle on West 36th Street. Hey, and we are back with George Hook, Mike Friday, and Martin Pingelli. Gentlemen, we haven't talked about England beating Australia. Were England... That good, or was Australia that bad? I think I thought the, the Kyle Sinclair try summed up the game quite well because it was a very subtle pass from uh, Owen, uh, Owen Farrell, but a sort of well, he didn't actually go through anyone because he went through, through a gap. He went into Kirtley Beale at the end, which filled my heart with, with, with gladness <laughs> and a whole new appreciation for Sir Kyle Sinclair. Um, but the power that he displayed sort of summed up the England team to me. It's is, a, there, is there some undercurrent against the Australians now as well? Yeah, obviously. Oh, well, who do you who do you loathe more, the Welsh or the Aussies? Well, in, in strict, strictly speaking, in rugby terms, I'm not. I'm not. Um, this is not. This is way beyond just rugby terms. Well, the the Welsh, <laughs> <laughs> followed followed by the New South Welsh. Put it that way. Okay, fair enough. I set Russell Crowe. I love him. I will have my vengeance. Yeah, I just thought I, th- I think England. This England team is proficient. It's an about and it's about power. Um, I don't. We're going to get onto predictions later. I don't see they have the rugby uh, skills to beat the All Blacks, but um, they were more powerful and slicker than the Australian team. And the Australian team is, you know, good at counterattacking, good at attacking, but blown away, really. George, England Australia. What did you take out of that match? Uh, check a lost that I think for Australia. Australia are a very bad team, and the game of rugby union is in a very bad place. Uh, in Australia, behind rules, behind rugby league, and behind behind soccer. So um, this result will be very difficult for Australian rugby. This this will damage the game, I think, in Australia. They were simply very bad, and and England didn't have to be very good to beat them. But but the most interesting thing for me is there was a reasonable um, agreement that George Ford in one of our programs, we've talked about George Ford 
as maybe the best fly half at that point in the tournament. And then Jones comes along when the chips are really down in the knockout stages and he goes back to Farrell. That indicates a coach who really knows what he's about. He knows what he wants from England. England know what the coach wants from them. And I think they deliver very well. And and like he's got a great back three. Uh, a lot of us thought that Brown of Harlequin should travel as full back. Where now those of us who thought that are all proved wrong. I think Jones has hardly missed a step in this tournament. But the challenge he faces now, uh, he's only at base camp and Everest away. And <laughs> that's a big ask. Yeah. Hey, Mike, uh, on Twitter, you backed up Eddie Jones in a press conference when he was asked the question about <laughs> dropping George Ford. And he answered it with saying his role was changed. And you thought that was a good answer. I thought that was a good answer. You want to pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, again, George is, is spot on. I think Eddie knows what he wanted to do. But I think if I'm Checker, as soon as that team's announced, I'm thinking they're bringing a strong defensive line. They're coming at us and they're going to be very direct in attack. So why on earth would you try and run it out when you're 22? Not just for the first 10 minutes, but for the first 80 when you've, you know, you've realised that you're not getting anywhere. Yeah. And it just played straight into England's hands. So it made it very, very easy for the England team to take full advantage. And, and boy, didn't they. Is any shot or any reason for New Zealand to tinker with their lineup and put Barrett at 10? I think they'll start with the same team. I think you know, Barrett was man of the match, wasn't he, at fullback? Yeah. <laughs> I think he touched the ball more yeah. times at fullback than he did at 10. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, they're just so interchangeable as a, as a, as a backline. They're all great rugby players. They're great footballers. They're, they're interest, interesting enough, their, their ability to play the kick-pass game and unlock defences from strikes are, are crucial. And, and I think that's something that England need to be aware of going into, into this semi-final. They've got to find a way to, to stop the New Zealand set-piece and their launches and their ability to find space with ball in hand or ball on foot. That's the challenge. Well, I mean, why Jones is so good and why England are at this point in the World Cup is he has a strategy and they've they, they played it uh, in this World Cup and they've played it in the last Six Nations Championship and they've played it in the warm-up games. Um, one is they have some extraordinary forwards uh, like Itoje is, would, would be in any World 50 in, in the second row, for instance. I've, I've, like They're probably slightly dodgy at hooker. But there are very few weaknesses in this side. They're intensely physical. I, he's got the right fly half at the right time in the shape of Farrell who can play into that kind of game. Now, the only thing is that you can do that against other teams. You can't necessarily do it against the All Black. And like the, the record... Uh, since, I don't know, since Captain Cook arrived with a rugby ball under his arm, uh, they have they have been rarely beaten. And you just get a sense that if they get it right, they can't be beaten. And I, if you refer, you I'm talk about easy. Chicago and Ireland beating I'm them. I, I have a rule about the All Blacks. In order to beat the All Blacks, you have to play way above yourself and they have to play way below themselves. Yeah. And yeah. if you look at Chicago, it was the worst performance by an all-black side that I think I've ever seen, and it was one of the best performances that I've ever seen by Ireland. So Ireland won. What does England have to do to beat New Zealand? I know that you're, you, I think you're picking New Zealand with your head rather than your heart in this one. No, I'm pick, well, obviously with my heart, I'm English, but I also have nothing against Kiwis at all. I like them. Um, what do they have to do? They nothing have to... at all against Kiwis? Nothing. No. Oh. Uh, all right. Okay. Well, all right. One thing: when uh, Eddie jo <laughs> when Eddie Jones picked out and was trying to needle them in the press conference and said their press are fans with keyboards, I think there's something in that. And I know some Kiwi journalists. I think they're a bit partial. They're a bit like rugby league reporters to me. They're they're boosting. I think. Anyway, I'm I'm certainly chargeable of that when I'm writing about the Eagles. So there you go. Uh, I think England. I think George is right. England have to be above themselves. The All Blacks have to be below themselves. I do think England's pack is. Phenomenally strong. I, I don't think they're dodgy at hooker. I think Jamie George is a fantastic player, and Cowan Dickey is a very good backup. Um, How about I think, Joe Marler? Well, 
They've got him in, in reserve too, don't they? I mean, they've but got- what I'm saying is, 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 is based on that, is that strength the same as the depth or the strength of the subs of the Kiwis? Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't get a weak All Black, do you? <laughs> you just, there isn't such a thing as a weak All Black. But I, I mean, I think, I think back, I can't believe it's only last November when England lost 16 15 at home. And here we go on the video thing again. I don't think Underhill was offside or whoever it was who, who it wasn't Underhill, it was Underhill's try, whoever. Was called offside at the back. He was offside. No, he wasn't. Um, it, they can do it. They can do it, but they have to be above, and the All Blacks have to be below. And you don't know that many All haven't. Again, you wouldn't know many All Black teams who would be off the boil for a semi, especially against England. Hopefully, we have two games to potentially change the rest of our lives. That's Dan Bigger. Mike, is that locker room fodder for the other team? Uh, I think it's interesting. It's a very similar message to Alan Winjango. Um, and I think it's probably the, the collective belief and collective uh, unity that the, the whole Welsh squad will have and that Gatlin would have instilled in them. He, he, will, be, he will be telling them, you've got 160 minutes. Yeah. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're going to be there to the, the end of the World Cup, whether they're playing in the final or the, the third, fourth place, and they need to go one, one better than I think they have before. I think they won third in 87. I'm not sure. I can't remember. I think that's right. But I, I genuinely think if, if Jonathan Davis is fit, I, I think they've got a real shot. I think he, he brings everything that they lacked defensively and he also brings that clarity and accuracy they crave in defence, sorry, in attack. Um, and he is a big game player. The South African, they've got great pace in the wings. They've got a very reasonable fullback. Pollard is a lot better than you think he is. Because Pollard is playing for South Africa. He's not playing for Matt McCarthy's Eagles. And he's playing a game that they want him to play. They've got a wonderful scrum half. Now, if you have really good halfbacks and you've got a really strong back three, you're about 60% of the way to having a winning side. Normally, therefore, if you want to beat a team like that, your only chance is to stuff them up front. And the, and the South Africans are unstuffable particularly by Wales. So therefore, for me, uh, of the two semi-finals, this is the most certain that South Africa are going to be in a final uh, and New Zealand are going to be in a final, which would be a wonderful final, refereed by the best referee in the tournament, Wayne Barnes. But, Mike, have you ever seen Wayne Barnes and Stephen Merchant in the same room at the same time? <laughs> I haven't, No. I think Wayne Barnes would be happy being called Steve Merchant because he's a little bit slimmer than Barnes. Eh? It's not meant to off- not meant to offend. I have oodles of respect for both of those gentlemen. But uh, George, I I, can't, I agree with you as per uh, your assessment of South Africa here. But you know Matt McCarthy's Eagles. If you're going to miss gimme penalty kicks like Pollard has missed, I got AJ McGinty over him every day of the week. That's just me. Yeah. Uh, but I I think Wales is a little bit too banged up at this point. They don't have the depth in size specifically to go up against South Africa. And I think, I think South Africa is going to going to make this a final with New Zealand. And unless Martin, there's something that you have in your bag of tricks over there to convince me otherwise. I'm afraid I don't. I mean, I can, I can explain where part of my, uh, I mean, I wouldn't predict Wales were going to win anyway, because they're not, but um, part of my reluctance to do so, if I wanted to would come from one of the first podcasts I ever did in 2008, back at the guardian. Um, I tried a joke with Sean Edwards, who was on the phone about um there was some vote there was a, don't try a joke with sean edwards on the phone it's not a good idea it's got to be a visual thing or just don't joke with him at all yeah, he just goes for slapstick he just he yeah. just likes early Pen- pencils like, up the nose funny yeah. early woody Allen. Like, yeah yeah um he uh i tried to joke it was about some stupid social media thing even in those days um it fell flat and i'm never gonna forget <sighs> the abuse i got in the comment section on the on the guardian website for that some welsh person was Welsh person called me a hooray Henry from the West Park car park at Twickers, which I'm not. I, I, I sound like one. I sound like one. I look like one, but I'm really not. I'm from the, I'm from the North. It got me so angry. Anyway, that's my, uh, you know, Darth Vader Star Wars story. They're not, it, it, they're not going to beat South Africa, I don't think. I mean, they've beaten them four times in a row, but those are friendlies, as George says. This is different. This, this South Africa pack by this Wales pack is unstuffable, as George says. I agree with that. Andre Pollard is not a weak link, as you say. I don't agree with that. I think South Africa have got this one. So nobody's alarmed that it was only 5-3 at halftime versus Japan. 
Oh, it was Japan were playing out of their skins with about, were was they? it 48,000 Japanese fans yeah. roaring them on and the right. rest of the world roaring them on. I thought South Africa did, as uh, was discussed earlier. I'm not think, convinced. I think Wales have got a far better back three than South Africa. A far better back three than South Africa. And I, I think, and Mike, getting back to what you said, I think if Foxy's healthy and uh, Bigger's yeah. in there and he's healthy, I think Wales yeah. have a puncher's chance, and I'm going with Wales. Without, without shout, I'm with you. Man, yeah. I, I, I think the Gats factor is going to be a big part as well. All right, so we're going two, we're going two and two here. Two, two of us for South Africa and two of us for Wales. I like that. Mike, right. you are officially picking Wales, right? Yes, I'm with Wales, yes. All right, all right. And I, I will see you in England in a couple of days. Uh, on that note, my friends, I want to thank you very much for coming on. We are out of time. I want to thank Mr. George Hook calling in from England. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Mike Friday, who was interrupted earlier and had to tell somebody that he's doing an interview. Michael. Yeah. <laughs> No worries. Okay. And Mr. Martin Pengelly, who is back to his healthy self no longer, and also dressed like Mar Roger Moore. Yes, and also experiencing evident mental illness about Welsh people. But Vic and Frogus can be tasked with Tarden on Gavin Henson. Gavin Henson, famous. Gavin Henson. 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 Uh, in Sweden, we watched uh, Let's Dancing. <laughs> On that note, we are out of time. Matt McCarthy for all of these gentlemen. Or rugby wrap-up here in Midtown Manhattan, talking rugby and signing off.